Previously on Dragon Ball. Avatar. Trigun. Overly Sarcastic Productions. I began the Journey to the West series. Journey to the West being one of these classic stories of like ancient Chinese lore. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Overly Sarcastic does with part two. Welcome back, friends, and a special welcome, welcome to all the new friends out there. I'm Yo BGS, and yeah, I mentioned Dragon Ball because this unapologetically took from a lot of what we've been covering so far in Journey to the West. Admittedly, a lot happened in a really short video. Red from Overly Sarcastic Productions did a amazing job of summarizing a ton of info, so I'm hoping we get a little bit of a recap here. I'm just excited to see what's gonna happen in parts two through six of this amazing journey. If you wanna go on this journey with me, make sure to subscribe, by the way. Only like a quarter of the people who watch my videos are actually subscribed, so if you subscribe, you'll be up to speed on everything we're doing, including what we're about to start right now. Last time on the journey to the West, the mischievous monkey king, Sun Wukong, after achieving immortality. The mischievous monkey king. Oh wait, I forgot, okay, I remember now. So Sun Wukong is like seven times immortal because he's done all these different things that give him layers of immortality. And now, yeah, he's like a gigantic monkey and the six ways from Sunday was brought down by the forces of heaven and placed inside Lao Tzu's brazier of the eight trigrams to be rendered down into an immortal elixir. However, our hero proved too powerful for this scheme and broke free, wreaking even more havoc in heaven. But his reign of terror was abruptly ended when he was imprisoned by the heavenly Buddha beneath the five phases mountain, where he must now wait for a chosen... Oh, okay, right, because the Buddha... So the Buddha was like... It had something to do with if you can stand on my hand or something then you can, if, or it was like, if you can get away from my hand, then you will be ultra immortal. And then the Buddha was like, actually, JK, the world is my hand. And then he was like, wait, what? And now he's under a boulder. Someone to come set him free. So Buddha returns to his home, the Thunderclap Monastery, where he spends a relaxing 500 years writing up three baskets of scripture. Now, these three scriptures are apparently so powerful that they are capable of redeeming even the most sinful of sinners. Well, sounds fishy to me, but hey, I'm not the guy with the universe in the palm of his hand. So these maze balls. He's got the whole world in his hand, and apparently, forget country balls, we need to start talking about amaze balls at this point. I'm into these. These look amazing. Aw. I tried to do a joke where I looked the right way, and I looked the wrong way. Clearly, I don't... I'm not worthy of the scriptures. The scriptures need to be delivered to the land of the East in order to spread Buddhism to the sinful folk who live there. But there's just one problem. For some reason, Buddha can't deliver them himself. So they need to find someone in the land of the East who can make the journey to the Western Heaven to pick up the scriptures and then return with them. Our friend the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin volunteers to find such a person, and after receiving five... You notice how early on, Red talked so much faster? Like, I would debate putting closed caption on for this, but I think even that wouldn't keep up. Also, I have to laugh because if you watch Cinema Sins, um, this is the part where he would go roll credits because they need to find somebody to take a journey to the West which is also the name of the story. Take the journey to the Western Heaven to pick up the scriptures and then return with them. Our friend the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin volunteers to find such a person, and after receiving five magical artifacts to give to the scripture pilgrim, she goes off eastward to find someone worthy of making the journey to the West. Roll credits. So Kuan Yin and ah! her disciple- No way! No way! I don't believe that! <laughs> if you ever needed proof that I don't watch these videos ahead of time, that literally the exact reference I just made. That is so funny. To give to the scripture pilgrim, she goes off eastward to find someone worthy of making the journey to the west. Roll credits. So Kuan Yin and her disciple Moksha head out along the route the scripture pilgrim will have to take as a way to test the waters and make sure the guy can make it through in the first place. Their first encounter with a murderous river spirit three minutes out from the Thunderclap Monastery is not exactly encouraging. But Kuan Yin persuades the guy to chill out and wait for the pilgrim and then to join and aid him on his quest with the added bonus that he'll be redeemed for the crime that got him exiled to the river in the first place. The other thing that's funny too, or interesting, I guess, really cool about a lot of this is the parallels and like the the things that you see borrowed or, you, you know, the plot devices, right? Because this is a very Iliad, Odyssey, Homer-esque type quest that they're going on here. And then the idea of the multiple artifacts, like I think about that, you know, in Yu-Gi-Oh! with the all the Millennium items and things like that. And that's not the only... Right? That's not the only manga that has the MacGuffins in it, the things that you have to go get and bring to the place. And it's just, it's wild to see how over, what, a thousand years at this point, a lot of those things keep 
uh, recurring. He accepts the offer and is given the name Sha Wu Ching, or Sandy for short. Don't ask me how Sandy is short for Sha Wu Ching. So Quan Yin and Moksha continue on their merry way, whereupon they encounter a pig demon wielding a huge rake. He and Moksha fight for a little bit until- Technoblade, question mark? They encounter a pig demon wielding a huge rake. He and Moksha fight for a little bit until he notices Kuan Yin and immediately stops the fight in favor of asking her for forgiveness because he's made something of a habit of eating people who come along the road. You know, because he's a demon. Kuan Yin again suggests that he join the pilgrim too when he comes along this way and thus be forgiven for the whole eating people thing. And the pig agrees. And Kuan Yin is putting this pilgrim in pretty questionable company. Kuan Yin gives him the name Chu Wu Neng, Pigsy for short, and heads off, leaving Wu Neng to remain- Do they really call him Pigsy or did they just shorten it to that for the purposes of- for the purposes of our journey to the West storytelling. And again, another item common in a lot of what we see, especially when you look at like Eastern RPGs, this idea of going along, building your party. And strictly vegetarian until the pilgrim arrives. So they continue onwards when, surprise, they encounter yet another charming individual who could potentially help our as yet nebulous pilgrim. Can you tell that this story is the origin of a lot of anime tropes? In this case, our colorful- That's what I- mm. I want to be friends with red and blue because they think like I do. Character is a young dragon who accidentally set fire to his dad's palace a little and for this transgression against fire safety has been sentenced to death by the Jade Emperor. Kuan Yin persuades the Emperor to pardon the young dragon and then she directs him to a nearby river where she instructs him to turn into a white horse when the pilgrim passes by to help him reach his destination. Anyway, they continue on only to encounter an unexpectedly luminous mountain, the Mountain of Five Phases and with it, the imprisoned Monkey King. Oh my God. So the crowd pop. I need to, because this says what? Do not, do not elevate, maybe? And then a hey down here. At least Son Wukong is maintaining all the annoyance levels of Navi from Ocarina of Time. And with it, the imprisoned Monkey King. So Wukong's like, Quan Yin, how's it going, girl? Great to see ya. It's been really lonely for the past 500 years, you know? Nobody ever comes by to visit. And Quan Yin's like, yeah, that's great. Listen, I'm about to go find someone to make a pilgrimage for me. He'll be coming by soonish. He's gonna release you from this mountain, and then you need to help him get where he's going. You got that? And Wukong's like, 10-4, good buddy. Yep, I am just all about that virtuous mission. So Quan Yin and Mo- These deities are meant to be wise, right? These deities are meant to be all-knowing, right? So, in what dimension would an adventurer releasing the most chaotic force we've seen in literature to this point be a good idea. Cho arrive in the city of Chang An and disguise themselves so as not to attract too much attention. Then they set about finding the right monk to serve as the protagonist to this little adventure. Speaking of protagonist, here's where the book veers off into a tangent to describe the ludicrously convoluted family history of this dude, Xuan Zhang, who, in case you hadn't already guessed, is our soon-to-be protagonist. Now that happens in the Bible, too. There are a lot of books of the Bible that open with like three or four chapters of just lineage. Now, Xuanzang has one of the most complicated family histories in all of epic protagonistdom. I won't recount the whole thing here because that would take all day, but basically he's the grandson of an emperor, he's been raised as a monk his whole life after being Mosesed by his mother, and he's the reincarnation of Golden Cicada, an original disciple of the Buddha and a holy being. So Xuanzang is basically the best guy ever and a total sweetheart, despite the wacky circumstances of his birth. So long story That's short, three horrible. court officials convene to select a worthy monk for reasons completely unrelated to Quan Yin's mission. And of course they select Xuanzang, the biggest boy scout in all of ancient China. Anyway, Quan Yin catches wind of this and goes to see if he's worthy of being the scripture pilgrim. She finds her way to the court officials and gives them two of the various gifts the Buddha had given her to give to the pilgrim so that they might give them to the most virtuous monk they know. So Xuanzang gets a beautiful robe and a priestly staff, both courtesy of Quan Yin. I'm so, it's so visually distinct from my last one. I love how much he is a foil to Sun Wukong at this point. Like, modest, bald... <laughs> And Kuan Yin learns that Xuanzang is the best man for the job. So the Grand Mass, which is the thing that they selected Xuanzang for, happens, wherein Xuanzang has to present a memorial to the Tang Emperor. Xuanzang. I was trying to remember. That's unfortunately the thing, like, to my, you know, American brain, is when you hear a lot of names that aren't familiar, or at least maybe this is just me and my being ignorant, but they all jumble together. And when they're coming in rapid succession, it's really tough. But Xuanzang... Zong, I, I'm going to get that word. Quan Yin takes the opportunity to steal the show by revealing herself in all her glory to the court and officially requests a volunteer from the audience to go on the pilgrimage to go to the Western Heaven and retrieve the Tripitaka, which is the official name for the thing the Buddha made. Xuan Zong obviously oh. volunteers, just as planned, and Xuan Zong is given the by name Tripitaka and sent on his merry way with a horse and two attendants to help him. Don't get too attached to them, though, as the party is captured by demons almost immediately and Tripitaka's two attendants are killed and eaten. Great. Don't suppose you gents turn to stone in the sun. 
I knew we weren't important enough to survive. Start. So the demons finish their attendant buffet and bunker down for the night, leaving poor Tripitaka to ponder his exciting future as lunch meat, when suddenly a mysterious old man appears out of nowhere and frees him. And Tripitaka's like, Where the heck did you come from? And the old man's like, Don't ask stupid questions. Here's your horse. So Tripitaka and the old man zip out of the cave, and Tripitaka goes to thank him, only to find that he's vanished, leaving a note explaining that he was the gold star of Venus himself, providing a helpful bit of divine. Get yourself better sidekicks and consider a dragon instead of a horse. But the horse turned himself into a, or the dragon turned himself into a horse. An intervention. So Tripitaka goes on by himself for about half a day, only to discover that he really doesn't have the constitution for all this questing nonsense, and he and his horse are just about done with everything, when who should come to the rescue but a friendly, boisterous hunter named Po Chin, who spooks all the beasties that were harassing Tripitaka and offers to guide him to his home. So Po Chin and his family- Sup nerd. So wait, is this the, are these the embodiments of the- Characters that basically the deities went ahead to get them to help harassing Tripitaka him. and offers to guide him to his home. So Pochin and his family have Tripitaka over for dinner, which is slightly awkward because Tripitaka is extremely vegetarian and Pochin's family hunts all their food, but they handle it gracefully and Tripitaka further endears himself to the family when he accidentally pacifies the ghost of Pochin's father, like you do, which prompts Pochin what? to offer to guide Tripitaka to the mountain on the border of the Tang Empire to ensure no further hijinks ensue. Did somebody say hijinks? So as it turns out, the mountain they get to is none other than Five Phases Mountain, where our good buddy Sun Wukong is still languishing. So Wukong's like, yo, kid, are you that pilgrim guy? Kuan Yin said you'd be coming by to let me out and tripitaka is like awesome how do i do that that mountain looks kind of heavy and wukong's like you just gotta climb to the top and peel off the golden seal Aww. why why is this the route thing thing is here so tripitaka manages to get the seal off the mountain and after he backs off to the minimum safe distance wukong breaks the mountain in half and zips on over so tripitaka and sun wukong continue westward together but they've hardly oh man i missed clothes that's not clothes this is a tiger you skinned yeah on 10 feet down the road when suddenly they're beset by bandits. So Wukong's like, don't worry, master, I know exactly what to do in this situation, and proceeds to kill all the bandits with his trusty <laughs> stick thing. And Tripitaka's like, son, we don't kill people. And Wukong's like, I think you mean you don't kill people. And Tripitaka's like, no, no, you're Buddhist now, Buddhists do not kill. And Wukong's like, ooh, look at Mr. Big Shot over here telling me who I can and can't kill. And storms off in a huff, which, if you'll recall his not inconsiderable mobility, means the Monkey King is over the horizon before poor Tripitaka can get a retort out. So Tripitaka heads off on his own for a bit, and when he runs into a mysterious old woman holding a fancy shirt and cap. So the old lady's like, Hey, what's the matter, kid? You look like a super-powered disciple just totally ditched you or something. And Tripitaka's like, You got it in one, mysterious old woman. <sighs> if only I had some way to discipline him, maybe the story could actually progress. And the old woman's like, Funny you should say that. May I recommend that you give him these fancy duds, and then recite this spell? I have this weird feeling that'll stop causing so much trouble if you do. And Tripitaka's like, Seems legit. Then the old- Up. Uh Yep, I was just about to say. So basically, the lady turns into a beam of light and vanishes because she was really Quan Yin. So, so basically, Quan Yin is the dungeon master here, right? Quan Yin's the dungeon master. Sun Wukong doesn't want to play well with Tripitaka, and so now she has to keep things on the rails and literally just devised magic items that are gonna make. The campaign Thus far, go Tripitaka on is two here. for two for old people secretly being gods. Meanwhile, Wukong is off having a nice little tea party with the Dragon Emperor, who suggests that he go back to Tripitaka rather than abandoning enlightenment and true immortality. Over Don't you think something that important deserves a take two? I love the way that they're, you know, again, omnipotent super beings, and they just have a, how's the Buddhism thing going? We broke it off. Artistic differences level of how first of all if this is how you choose to spend your spare time how are you having artistic differences with anyone Wukong is off having a nice little tea party with the dragon emperor who suggests that he go back to tripitaka rather than abandoning enlightenment and true immortality over a single argument wukong zips back westward blowing past kuan yin in the process who'd flown over in order to convince him of that very course of action so wukong warps back to tripitaka who offers him the clothes wukong always maybe this will take uh, make you think twice about pulling that stun again this is my bad behavior <laughs> you're being rewarded again God, I felt and that. In the process, who'd flown over in order to convince him of that very course of action. So Wukong warps back to Tripitaka, who offers him the clothes. Wukong, always a sucker for a new wardrobe, throws them on, finding that they fit him perfectly. He's rather less thrilled to discover that the hat is cursed, and when Tripitaka recites the spell Kuan Yin taught him, it's- Whoa. So you think... Is this- Oh my god, that is... Part of Bohemian Rhapsody... That is Bohemian Rhapsody. Like, right... Yeah, right here. We've got, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Let's see. I don't know that song. So it's obviously song lyrics. Is Mila Thunderbolt? Nothing really matters. So all of this part is Bohemian Rhapsody. 
Oh no, this okay, so the whole thing the whole thing <laughs> the whole thing is looped Bohemian Rhapsody. That is damn impressive. Drinks and gives him a splitting headache. Of course, it wouldn't be much of a cursed artifact if he could take it off, so it's also spot welded to his head. After a few very entertaining minutes of Wukong trying furiously to escape the hat by any means necessary, he eventually resigns himself. I really want to read this now because I want to know what in ancient Chinese text uh, descriptions are a few hilarious minutes. Like, I want to know what that comes across as in ancient Chinese text. Self to the fact that he won't be able to get up to his usual hijinks anymore. So the dynamic duo continue onwards with the balance of power now tilted slightly more evenly. And it doesn't take long before they arrive at a nice calm stream that happens to be home to an enormous fuck you dragon. Wukong nopes the hell out of there with Tripitaka in tow, and the dragon takes the opportunity to eat Tripitaka's horse. So Tripitaka freaks out, since without a ride he's stranded, but he's also too scared to let Wukong leave him alone. But a bit of timely divine intervention arrives to protect Tripitaka, leaving Monkey free to confront the dragon. So they fight it out for a bit, but the dragon- First dragon's real fight in 500 years. Like, screw it, and dives to the river bottom and refuses to come out. Wukong does some magic shenanigans and draws the dragon- Come up and fight me like a man or a dragon, I don't care, just fight to come me. out. Wukong does some magic- Oh, look at the big scary monkey king. Can't even beat up one measly dragon. The, okay, big time, big time Vegeta vibes now from both of the them. shenanigans and draws the dragon out again, only for the dragon to turn into a water snake and run away. At this point, Wukong is done, but the local mountain spirits tell him that this dragon is actually under orders by Quan Yin to help them. So one of the heavenly spirits goes and gets her, and after a brief digression where Wukong vents at her about the cursed hat thing, she draws out the dragon, and Wukong picks a fight with him, too. Look, he's had a trying day, all right? Anyway, Quan Yin gets the dragon to turn into a horse for Tripitaka to replace the one he ate, and then, to make Wukong stop sulking, she gives him three get-out-of-danger-free magical leaves. So now, with the matter having been resolved to everyone's so now he's nine times immortal has three get out of jail free cards but is bound to hang out with tripitaka this totally makes it for the loss of my freedom always wanted a horse who could eat me satisfaction our dynamic trio continue west to be fair any horse could eat you they just choose not to so anyway they continue on and arrive at still yet another monastery run by a sketchy old monk long story short the monk lays eyes on that really fancy monk robe tripitaka got way back when it's called a cassock by the way and takes it into his head to steal it and to that end he decides the best way to go about it is to burn down his own monastery well that's not very zen of him so wukong smells the smoke weighs his options and decides the best way to solve um i mean immolation of things that you um are attached to is actually very zen right because you're not supposed to be attached to anything that's the whole point of zen and and buddhism is earthly stuff doesn't matter although i guess i guess he's just trading one addiction for another right he got rid of his monastery but then by the same token, he wants the robe, which is just as bad. The situation without pissing off Tripitaka is to let the monks burn their monastery to the ground. But first, he borrows a fireproof cloak from one of his heavenly buddies to make sure Tripitaka and the horse don't burn with it. Is it just me, or is Monkey on shockingly good terms with all the people he beat the hell out of in the last video? The that's how, well, I was gonna say that's how Dragon Ball works, but I guess that's... Again, I'm, I'm cart before the horse. Because if you think about it, in Dragon Ball, that happens too. Everyone that Goku beats up in Dragon Ball becomes part of the Z fighters in Dragon Ball Z. So, like, it, it's sort of a thing. Sit tight, I need you to make this place burn down slightly faster. Good gracious. Maybe, but... So maybe him being locked up for 500 years was enough to make them okay with him like maybe they all think he learned his Tripitaka lesson and the horse don't burn with it is it just me or is monkey on shockingly good terms with all the people he beat the hell out of in the last video the fire eventually burns itself out and Tripitaka finally wakes up only for them to find out that during all the confusion a mountain demon came by and stole the cassock also the patriarch monk killed himself so anyway wukong zips on over to the demon's mountain and they fight but the demon calls a killed himself did he really where are my clothes? Thanks for saving my life again, son, in return. I'll never do the hat thing again. Demon came by and stole the cassock. Also, the patriarch monk killed himself. So anyway, we Need my clothes back. Wukong zips on over to the demon's mountain and they fight, but the demon calls a lunch break and locks himself in his mountain. So Wukong zips back to the ruined monastery for snacks, then returns to the mountain to sneak in. So Wukong disguises himself as the old monk and has a little tea party with the mountain demon, and then they fight more, but the demon runs away again. I love the, the spike of music for just a fraction of a second. A little tea party with the mountain demon, and then they fight more. But the demon runs away again, and Wukong decides to call in the cavalry. He goes to Kuan Yin, but together they figure out another way to sneak in and get the cassock back. Kuan Yin disguises herself as a Taoist friend of the demons, and Monkey King disguises himself as a present from that friend, a pill of immortality. Long story short, Wukong beats up the demon from the inside. Oh, Ew. come Kuan on! Kuan Yin retrieves the cassock, and Wukong returns it to Tripitaka, and they continue on their merry way. Will Sun Wukong learn to value friendship over his impulsive desires? Will I mean, when his friendship allows for impulsive desires, he doesn't have to mix the two up. You know what I mean? Like, 
This friendship is allowing him to be just an impulsive mess. And Wukong returns with Tripitaka and they continue on their merry way. Will Sun Wukong learn to value friendship over his impulsive desires? Will Tripitaka succeed in his quest to the Thunderclap Monastery? Will that stupid horse ever remember he can fly? Find out next time on Journey to the West. Dang, I like that. I like the outro. That's super, like, I love, I don't know, I love the Dragon Ball Z references. And that, as a video, was just awesome. I don't know. Something about, like, something about this storyline. And it may be the fact that it is really just Journey to the West Kai. You know, it's a thousands and thousands of pages book summarized in 10-minute bite-sized segments that pleases the ADHD in me. And the fact that Red, like, Red has a great eye for picking out the things that are important and being able to present them in a way that you can keep straight in your brain. I feel like it would be really easy to do a book report on this and just get everyone lost in the middle. So for Red to keep everyone's attention throughout it, it, it is awesome. Do I need to do, should we keep rolling with part three, friends? Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, as always, I hope you have an amazing weekend. It's a long weekend, Memorial Day and all that good stuff. So take care, my friends, and I will see you in the next one.